and welcome back to Politics in Hawaii on Think Tech Hawaii with Dennis Isaki. Today we'll be speaking with Vicky Cayetano, candidate governor of Hawaii. She's a successful businesswoman. She has starred in a movie with Elvis Presley, is the sister of super pianist Jenny Tu. Oh yeah, she was also the first lady of Hawaii. Vicky, thank you for joining us. Welcome to Think Tech Hawaii. Well, thank you for having me, Dennis. Yeah. It's always yeah. a pleasure to see you. Yeah. Um, you've been uh, here about a year ago. A lot has happened. Um, you know, tell us uh, what has happened in the past year. Well, it's been very interesting for sure. I announced officially on August 30th, 2021. And in that time, uh, putting together a team, a strategy, uh, reaching out to communities all across our state on every island is I think so important. Uh, and in the process, learning more and more about the needs. Some are very similar and some unique to every community. Um, but just being able to listen and to hear for so many, the silent majority, I call them, that are really suffering. Um, you know, five years in a row, Dennis, our state's lost population. And the people who are leaving, young people, the middle class, working people, without them, Hawaii cannot hope, you know, to have a thriving community. So this is, we're really at a very critical time, but listening to them uh, gives me both a challenge, but also encouragement because the issues that we talk about are preventable. They're not inevitable. Yeah, thanks. <laughs> you, you was just on a uh, spotlight away. Um, one of the things you talked about was you plan to reduce the income tax for middle-class people. Uh, what would you do to make up the money for the state government? So the plan is basically to call for an exemption on the state income tax uh, for earnings of 50000 and under. You know, this translates to approximately $3,200 a year. Now, if you take someone who's making $20 an hour, that translates to an additional one month or 20 days of income right off the bat. I mean, that is a game changer because when you talk to a lot of employees, they say, you know, by the time you take out this, 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 uh, what I put in my pocket doesn't make sense for me to go to work. And, and that's a valid argument. So by doing this, it helps them immediately to have $3,200 uh, that goes straight to their pocket that can then be pumped into the economy as well. Uh, how we make up for it is going to be one, looking at, uh, first of all, the state coffers, the surplus that we have, uh, working with the legislature, we should be able to do this. Long-term, we need to analyze uh, the impact of this on the uh, state tax revenue and look for opportunities both to cut expenses in state uh, inefficiency. And again, not anybody's fault. I think workers work really hard to be efficient, but just modernizing our state government. Uh, I'm sure you're aware that our IT accounting systems are over 40 years old. So we're not nearly as efficient as we could be. And then we can look at the GE tax because about 30% of the general excise tax revenue comes from visitors, tourists. Uh, and perhaps we can offset an increase, a slight increase in GE tax with also waiving tax on food and over-the-counter drugs for residents who, um, who make less than $100,000 a year. At the end of the day, we've got to stop the working people, the middle class, uh, the young people from leaving Hawaii. Otherwise, uh, all these ideas we want to do, affordable housing, improve health care. If you don't have the population to do this, you cannot achieve anything. So oh, that's a great plan. Um, so your plan is 50,000 per person. So 
like a couple would be 100,000 for two people? That's correct. But it would be, now, if they file jointly, it has to be on the first 50,000. So that's what we would have to look at. Oh. But, you know, either way, it's going to, in my mind, provide immediate relief. If you look at, and, and we do need to increase minimum wage, but by the time you deduct for all the taxes, what goes into the pocket for the employee it is not as impactful as something like this. That's why I feel so excited about this idea. It is a game changer. Yeah, um, yeah, that's a good plan. Um, if people have say, like, you haven't been in, in government, so you don't have the experience, what do you say about that? I would say that what we really need is leadership. We need a leader who, one, uh, thinks outside the box to the problems we're looking at. Because the problems are so deep and so broad that the traditional way of approaching it, small kind change, isn't going to make any difference. We need bold, creative leadership. We need someone who can communicate and collaborate with people. Respectfully, I have 34 years of being a CEO. And being a CEO is very different from being one of 76 members in our state house or being one of 535 in Congress. So I respectfully would say that my opponents don't have the CEO experience that's going to be absolutely needed for the next governor to have. Yeah, thanks. Um, oh, this is a kind of sticky one. Recently, we have uh, seen politics at its worst at both ends of the spectrum. Uh, uh, what have you noticed? Oh, what do you say about that? You're talking about neg negative. Yeah, yeah. So I think negative. For me, defining negative is saying something that is not true. That's a big difference. But raising legitimate questions. As an employer myself for so many years, when I hire someone, I vet them. That is my job. And in particular, when you are going to be trusted with decisions that impact taxpayers and their hard-earned money, you need to be sure that the CEO of this state is vetted properly. That, Dennis, to me, is not negative campaigning. That is smart questions that needs to be asked. And if the media is not doing it, frankly, shame on them. Because that is, you know, a, a media's responsibility is the, the uh, conduit for information to the people of Hawaii. And so, I think that it's very legitimate to ask someone about their financial situation when they aspire to be the leader of this state. Yeah, it, it appears that uh, some of the media has uh, looked more at your questioning rather than the answers. Um, so perhaps that could be with you know who, who has more ads. Um, and on the other other side, you got some really negative ads going against some other candidates, and they run that. And at the same time, they run the ad for you know somebody else. So it's kind of uh, deals with like money talks. No, you're and, right. And, yeah, yeah. And I, I think the thing I'm very leery about is anytime money comes from outside the state of Hawaii, you know, or money that's from special interests, because then clearly, clearly there is a uh, um, motive and objective for any organization to pump a million or two million into a single campaign. Oh, come on, you got to ask yeah. question. What's in it for them, right? So I just be very leery of money that comes from special interests or from uh, outside of Hawaii. Yeah. Um, 
you know, we've been talking throughout the year about rising price of goods in Hawaii and housing uh, and, you know, going back to the middle class living in Hawaii, what uh, can you say about that? You know, tying in with businesses, kind of get workers. What do you say or what can you do about that? Well, you know, again, like I said, the problems are broad. It's not just fixing one thing. Affordable housing is certainly at the top of the list. But if you just do the housing without addressing things like opportunities, especially for young people, not everybody wants to be service industry job. And uh, we need to offer them together. So affordable housing is one thing. Uh, in one of my communications, I had said that I would look very seriously at freezing rent increases for 24 months. And let me be clear, I do not support uh, rent caps for permanent situations, but I do think that the way the housing market is uh, to help especially people like our kupuna on fixed income, we have to stop any increases for the next two years while we accelerate building affordable housing. This will help them not worry about, am I gonna get evicted, you know? So we need to address that. Uh, we need to look at the uh, cost of living. You know, HECO just announced because of a number of reasons now that electric, the uh, average electric bill is gonna go up much more than they had originally projected. And this is why, you know, I'm thinking we've got to provide relief immediately by exempting state income tax for people on the first $50,000 of earnings. This will help them tremendously. The other thing I do think we need to look closely at is uh, eliminating the GE tax on food and over-the-counter drugs. I know the argument against it because, you know, when you cut a big chunk out, then you may have to increase the tax on the on a smaller amount, right, of goods being taxed. So it's something we have to look at closely with the experts and with the legislature. Um, no governor can do this alone. So that is something we have to look at. And at the same time, we must look at uh, job opportunities, creating a more diversified economy outside of just uh, over-reliance on tourism. Like, like I mentioned, you know, a lot of businesses are closing. Um, businesses kind of get workers. Restaurants are cutting their hours. Uh, part of it is with COVID. Uh, what is your response to that? Well, that's why I say that we need leadership that is bold, that's going to come up with ideas that are outside of what we traditionally do, because the same way we've been doing it just isn't going to cut it. And the other thing I think that's really important is that we need a governor who is going to focus on taking care of these problems for the majority of the people, not for special interest groups. And I'm very happy that at this stage of my life, I am not beholden to anyone. That gives me the independence and the ability to make some really tough decisions but it will be done. I will do that for the people of Hawaii if I have the privilege to be the next governor. Um, you know, it's not a stepping stone to another job or another career. For me, at 66 years old, I am looking at leaving a legacy that really can say, I gave my all for the people. I, I know you've been... Uh sharing uh, with uh, other uh, nonprofit agencies and uh, helping a lot, a lot of people. And I guess it kind of overflows into this. Um, there's a lot of uh, tie to COVID in the last couple of years. Um, you know, my personal experience, you know, I've experienced it. And from my experience, I get a call saying, oh, I, I heard, you know, you had COVID, like, seemed like this 
state might be more interested in the statistics than the helping the people. You know, it's I really felt that way with the, with the way the questioning was. It didn't care <laughs> about anything else. Uh, what is your reaction to the COVID uh, pandemic? Well. You know, I think that they do care, but I think they're very single-minded on statistics. Number of cases, number of deaths, uh, impact to the hospitals. You know, I scratch my head and say, number one, why do we have, why don't we have more capacity? Why don't we have more beds? This is something we should do regardless of COVID. COVID just showed us how our shortage, you know, in capacity is. But I think the problem that people don't or leadership didn't think about or has the mindset to think about is how disruptive COVID is to businesses and to our communities, to our kids, you know, who lost two years uh, of their life. I have a grandson who is at, pub at Aina Haina Public School and not being able to go to school. And then when he went to school, having a mask on, you cannot see, he could not see your mouth moving. Uh, they lost two years. And that to me is one of the biggest problems is that leadership is just single-minded. Case count, statistics, number of deaths. But how about the impact to our community, to our economy? <laughs> I mean, that's what we have to deal with. And I do believe that there are ways that we can manage COVID so that it is less disruptive uh, to the workforce. Because like you say, when people are out because they've been exposed to someone or they themselves come down, added to the shortage of people, employees, it's you know a triple whammy. Uh, so here at our headquarters, we have these two... Uh, machines that basically project UV uh, to kill all the viruses. And I'm happy to tell you that in the one year here, even with all the gatherings we've had, we not had any cases of COVID related to meetings here at our headquarters. So we got to think outside the box of how government can give incentives to businesses, especially the small businesses, so that they can mitigate the impact of, of living with COVID without disrupting the workplace as we're seeing right now. You know, even flights being canceled, right? Because they don't have the staffing. Uh, we have got to find a way to do this so that we can uh, minimize that negative impact to our communities and to our economy. Uh, thanks. Um... You know, we touch upon a lot of things. You've been asked with all the other uh, interviews, things like tourism uh, and climate change. Any comments on those? You know, tourism plays such a big role for us as a state that one of the things I feel, Dennis, is really important is we need to ask the tourism industry hotels in particular, to be more of a partner in managing the resources that they utilize. Uh, so one of the things I would do very specifically is to work with the hotels and have them implement systems, mechanisms to monitor the amount of energy, water, and wastewater that they are using in their hotels, on their properties, per guest, so that that is a good starting point to say, how can we manage the utilization of our precious resources better by the seven, eight, nine million tourists that come every year? Uh, right now, there's no measurement. There's no accountability. And that has to start. Yeah, I heard you mention that uh, you compare the impact of a tourist versus a local resident, and it's, it's not the same, right? That's right. Uh, this person from the visitor industry, when I spoke about this, said, you're, you're spot on. He said, because uh, when they did their own studies, it was like two and a half times that they use. Um, so this isn't to discourage them. It's simply to say, globally, 
we have a responsibility to our environment. And so travelers need to do a reset <laughs> of their thinking and just can't come and, and, you know, without any accountability of how they uh, use our resources. And I think this behavior will uh, produce a different culture, a different mindset of people coming to Hawaii. And I think it will be much better. Yeah, and it affects a whole, whole bunch of things, you know, all the way down to the landfill, which is a big issue, a waste. Uh, Okay, what about agriculture? You know, all the politicians talking about agriculture, but uh, we don't see much uh, improvement. We still import most of our uh, food here into Hawaii. So, you know, the way we've managed agriculture, in my mind, is reflective of the way we've done so many things. It's too siloed off. Farmers, farmers working on theirs, Department of Ag, uh, CTAR, Agri, you know, business development. Uh, we need to bring everyone together, these valuable stakeholders, and really create a much more collaborative and coordinated plan uh, to support not only farmers, but really a sustainable plan for the state of Hawaii so that we are able to grow more here uh, to sustain us. You know, I was told on Maui, for example, they grow a lot of lemons, limes, and then they export them. You know, so why aren't we growing things that we could enjoy and, and have here on the islands for our residents? So the goal will be to increase a more than 12, 14 days worth of food that's for our residents. It, that is a very precarious position to be in when you think about it. 12 to 14 days, that's all we've got on island. So we have to start with a goal and then create the plan and then how to implement with accountability and urgency. Uh, um, it's... It's a very, uh, I wouldn't say touchy, but very important issue. Uh, and climate change, uh, you know, environmental issues, has a lot to do with, you know, uh, it ties in with tourism and land use, uh, shoreline management, uh, all of those, um, very important it seems like any uh anything to add on that it is and we're certainly not short on studies or expertise we have that at the university of hawaii already dr fletcher i think what we need to do is like i say though bring the parties together and put a plan in place with timelines accountability and uh you know, revisiting it. The state is great about coming up with ideas, and but the execution has always been a little bit short. And that's been my 34 years of experience is getting it done. I'm not so big on the talk, but I'm proud to say I'm just a doer. And that's what I want to do. That's why I'm running for governor, to get things done. I got uh, a lot of things to get done. Um, and like you said, there's a lot of talk. One of the big issues we're talking about now is the Red Hill uh, fuel issue. And of course, going back to the water and affecting the water, water table for drinking water. And also nobody talking about when it goes in the water, water also seeps into the ocean. There's a lot of that seeping in the ocean nobody talked about. So it's it's a big issue that uh, got to be handled. Would you do anything different on what would you call for with regards to the Red Hill issue? Well, I think we need to meet, of course, with the military, the Navy, uh, 
also the congressional delegation. I mean, I think at this point, if the Navy doesn't hear us loud and clear about a better timeline and a plan with details, you know, it cannot just be dismissive and say, here's a plan that's very general. Uh, then I think we need to work with the congressional delegation and use all the powers we have to take it up a notch higher. Because Hawaii is so important, not just, uh, you know, to the Navy, but really, uh, if you think of global security, uh, security, national security, we have to recognize what's at stake. And I would hope that they do see that and address Red Hill with urgency. Yeah, you get, um, you, you mentioned earlier about the uh, eco, you know, saying that uh, the price is going up. Uh, we're here uh, on Kauai, we have the Kauai Island Utility Cooperative. We're leading the nations in uh, renewable energy, and we're glad to say that uh, we're not going as much as the other, other places. Uh, so there's a lot more to be done on, on renewable energy, and uh, at the same, same time, uh, with the, you know, helping the environment. Exactly. Uh, written, yeah. Right now we're closing down the uh, coal-fired plants on Oahu. You know, up to now they've been providing about twenty percent of the energy. Granted, it's cheaper, but you know, that's not what we really want. Um, so you got to tie everything together. We do. Uh, we need yeah. to tie in, you know, yeah. dependability to reliability yeah. and cost. And of course, what we have to do to for climate change to address yeah. that. Yeah. It, um, getting back to the cost of business in Hawaii, people, you know, like you said, our children are leaving. Uh, what, is, what do you think everything, price of everything has gone up so drastically in the past year or two and what can we do to it so recognizing the supply chain issue and yes the ukraine war one of the things i want to do is a top to bottom review of that to really make sure that the increases are justified i know sometimes there are events that happen but businesses sometimes take advantage of it also and that's what I want to do is apply my knowledge in business to make sure that the people of Hawaii are being treated fairly with regards to, you know, shouldering the, the burden of these increased costs. I recognize there are increases, but are they justified or are frankly, are we are some of it, you know, really being taken advantage of, of our situation? We need to take a deeper look at that in order to make sure we're not being hoodwinked on this. Exactly. Uh, yeah, thanks, uh, Vicky. Uh, we're running out of time. Any last words? No, just thank you for having me. And, you know, from the beginning, the campaign has, my campaign has been about bringing real change to address these longstanding issues that we keep talking about. Enough of the talk. We've got to get uh, things done. Thank you. Yeah, thanks. Uh, we realize you're not doing it for the money. <laughs> uh, mahalo to our wonderful guests, Vicky Cayetano, and mahalo to the viewers on Think Tech Hawaii. If you like the Think Tech uh, free media shows, please help support this nonprofit platform. Aloha, mahalo, ahoi ho, malama pon. Thank you so much for watching Think Tech Hawaii. If you like what we do, please like us and click the subscribe button on YouTube and the follow button on Vimeo.
You can also follow us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and LinkedIn, and donate to us at thinktechhawaii.com. Mahalo.